Isn't this phenomenal material, this book of Acts? Isn't it phenomenal to begin to dig into it and allow it to begin to permeate your life and to find God speaking to you and drawing you and giving you a hunger for all that's being expressed in this book? Isn't it phenomenal to look into this book and see that, hey, the possibilities for your own life and what God wants to do and what He did in their lives and what He can do in our lives and how He wants to unfold His will and literally begin to produce us and live through us? Uh, the whole theme of this book of Acts just grips me. It just moves me at the depth of my inward being and tells me that, hey, I, I want to be totally His. I want to be in the flow of His life and I want to be in the movement of His being and I want Him to be able to to minister through me and perform that which he wants to do in my day. I want the will of God to be done. I want to be an unmarred, unblemished demonstration of what Jesus is all about because the very essence of the Spirit of God that lived in Jesus now lives in me and that lived in the disciples now lives in me. So the essence of what God's nature is has literally come to spill through me and to literally manifest itself to my world. I want that with all my heart. See, this book gives me a hunger for that, a desire for that. I see it in the lives of the disciples. I see it in the intimacy they had with Jesus. I see it in the wonder of what Jesus was, even in his resurrection. And now as he's totally leaning on the Holy Spirit, even in his ascension and on into the ascension ministry. I desire that for my life. We're finding that in the book of Acts. And I trust that it's a creating a, a hunger within you for the fullness of the Spirit, for the life of God to be manifested in and through you. Of course, the whole context of this is the former account. And we are looking at the first 11 verses, and we know that the first 11 verses are, are going back and, and getting a hold of the last things he talked about in the volume 1, and he's literally spilling it into uh, this, this volume 2 in order to kind of catch us up and get us back in the thought process of what the theme is really all about. So he's highlighting two issues. He's highlighting the issue of the resurrection. And then secondly, he's going to be highlighting the uh, issue of the ascension. We're going to see that in verse 9, 10, and 11. Literally, the context of the ascension is verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we've been dealing with that context, which is going to lead us into the ascension itself. Um, the whole idea of the resurrection that's highlighted is given to us in an expanded version. We saw at the last of Luke some of the uh, resurrection appearances of Jesus. And hey, those were really great. And he focused on those particular resurrection appearances. But as you move here, it's more of a general appearance of Jesus. It's a 40-day resurrection appearance. It, it is told to us, of course, in verse 3 that we have uh, tried to go to the depth of verse 3 and discover what that uh, resurrection appearance was really like. 40 solid days of intimacy. We know one thing for sure. They were absolutely moved by it. When they got done, it was infallible proofs. Hey, you could not talk them out of it. You could not get them sidetracked from it. They were so locked in on the resurrected Jesus. They were so thrilled with him. They had been so captured by him, so mastered by him. They had become so enthralled with his person. They couldn't, they couldn't talk about anything else. Hey, they weren't wrapped up in anything else. Hey, their arguments ceased. Everything that they had been a part of up to this point had been altered with the resurrection appearance of Jesus for 40 solid days. They came out of there absolutely moved with his presence, focused on his face, ready for Pentecost to take place. And indeed, it would in a matter of a few days. So this resurrection appearance and these infallible proofs become very, very significant in the whole flow of what uh, Luke is trying to tell us in this account. Uh, then we began to look at uh, the flow of what was happening, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. We have noticed, of course, in verse 4 that he begins to talk to them about the promise of the Father. And then he begins to explain that in terms of a contrast. Baptism of John the Baptist with the baptism of Jesus, uh, of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus. And then they got sidetracked in verse 6. We looked at this question that they asked. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They got a little sidetracked. Hey, they were still thinking uh, a, a bit strange. They were still thinking in their traditional manner. They were still thinking in terms of a restoration. 
that is the old time um, Solomon days, the days when Israel was in her pomp and glory. And hey, the, the, all the nations of the earth were scared to death of Israel. They look for that kind of thing to happen again. When, when are you going to bring that about? Thinking in terms of Rome and Caesar and setting up an earthly kind of kingdom. Jesus replied to them in verse 7 and 8. And that's our focus uh, even for today. Verse 7 he says, it's none of your business. Hey, when and now is none of your business. So get that out of your thought process. Well, if when and now is not my business, what is my business? Oh, it's verse 8. And he focuses us and brings us to the very heart of what it's all about as you move into verse 8. Let's read it together. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Oh, let's read it again. Get the words. Oh, fill your mind with them. Let them penetrate your heart. Words of Jesus himself now spoken to you and to me. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now in our last class period, we attempted to get at the concept of uh, verse 8. Uh, we, start, we attempted to stand back and, and just get the flow of what he was saying. What is the concept? What he is proposing? I, of course, have no way of uh, convincing you or telling you or overstating, actually, the whole significance of verse 8. Verse 8 is the key to the entirety of the book of Acts. It is the uh, table of contents. Any commentary you want to go to, again, will tell you as we have gone through the outline that this is the outline of the whole book. And we have used this as a springboard to literally divide up the book in the, in the categories of the journey and the, where the witness was going to take place. So he's going to write the book according to verse 8. See, verse 8 is the threshold over which you walk into the entirety of the rest of the book. Verse 8 becomes the mission statement, if you please. It's the kind of thing you put on a plaque and hang on the wall of the church. It's the, it's the purpose statement. It's, it's our focus. It's what we're all about. If we're about anything that happens, uh, if we're about anything that takes place, if, if we're about anything except what's in verse 8, hey, then we're not, we're not in the focus of, of, of Christianity. If we've got some things going on that aren't a part of verse 8, then dump them, man. Get rid of them. Don't waste your energy on them. It's, it's not necessary, it's not important, and it doesn't need to be done. Anything that's not a part of verse 8, hey, is not going to receive our attention. Verse 8 is our total focus. It is our master. It's what, it is what has consumed us. It is moving us, driving us, motivating us. Verse 8 is the whole deal. See, verse 8 is the entire of the rest, entirety of the rest of the book of Acts, literally brought down into a concentrated, concentrated, concentrated form. In other words, if, if you're going to really know what the book of Acts is all about, you need to know what verse 8 is all about. Verse 8 is the lens through which you're going to see the entirety of the rest of the book. You're going to understand and interpret all of the rest of the book according to verse 8. This is the deal. Here is what it's all about, man. Verse 8, verse 8, verse 8. Hey, it is the key. It is the pivot point around which the entirety of the book revolves. You get down to the store, uh, the grocery store, you, you buy this concentrated, uh, frozen um, grape juice, orange juice, whatever, and, and you bring it back. Hey, you don't drink that. You thaw it, down, uh, thaw it down, but hey, you don't drink that, man. Why, that's the concentrated form. You add water to that, and you, you, you bring that down into this proper portion. See, verse 8 is the concentrated form. It's, it, it's the heartbeat. It's the, it's the squeezed down essence, man. Hey, it's the, hey he's going to add some water to it. We're going to see it spill out into the rest of the book. We're going to see how it really operates. But hey, verse 8 is the concentrated form. Hey, it's the very essence of it all. Now again, verse 8 is the determining factor of the interpretation of the rest of the book.
See, you're going to have to see the whole rest of the book in light of verse 8. If you don't, you'll get sidetracked. If you don't, you'll, mis you'll misinterpret what the book is all about. See, verse 8 sets the stage. It sets the perimeters. It sets the standard by which you must interpret the entirety of the book. See, if you come to... Uh, if you come to verse 8, you cannot get sidetracked. You cannot, you cannot get off on tangents. For instance, if you see the whole book of Acts through the eyes of verse 8, hey, you'll not come to this book looking for some kind of uh, church growth strategies. You'll not use this book to interpret, oh, here's how we grow the church, step one, step two. Let's have house churches. They did, you know. And here's the kind of organizational structure we ought to have because this is, he's not writing a book on that, man. That's, it, this is not about church growth strategies. This is not about church in, uh, organizational structures. This is about the dynamic actions of the Holy Spirit through the, through the lives of men and what God wants to do. See, you'll, you'll, mis, you'll misinterpret the rest of the book and get off on tangents and you'll, you'll say that this book says things it doesn't say unless you get verse 8. You gotta get verse 8, man. Verse 8 is literally a key that unlocks the door that brings you into the whole rest of the flow of what the book is all about. Verse 8, verse 8, it's really significant. Verse 8, you gotta get verse 8, man. Verse 8 really matters. You see, if you miss verse 8, you may become legalistic. You may come into this book and find rules and they set things up and, and, and you, may be, uh, you may be calling down fire from heaven and, and, and literally uh, bringing people to death. You may enter into the Ananias, Sapphira kind of thing and, and you may just point the finger and try to... See, you, you, you'll miss what's going on if you miss verse 8. See, verse 8 is not about condemning people to death. Verse 8 is not about laws. See, this book is not about, hey, the laws for the operation of the early church. That's not what this is all about. See, legalism never could have been born, nor could it have survived if we'd have stuck with verse 8. See, verse 8 is all about the flow, the life, the empowerment, the sourcing of the Holy Spirit. Hey, that, that's what verse 8 is all about. And you must interpret the whole rest of the book in light of the flow of what's happening in verse 8. Verse 8 is the key to the entire book. Verse 8, verse 8, you got to get verse 8. Well, as we look at verse 8, we have looked at the concept in our last class period. Let me remind you what the concept is. And then we want to move to the actual words of verse 8 itself and begin to see what they have to say to us in light of the concept. So we're standing back. We're looking at the overall view of verse 8, seeing what is it exactly in conceptual form that he's trying to say to us as this, as this spills out to us. Uh, and in order to get it into our thinking again, let's come back and read it one more time. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Oh, phenomenal verse. What's the concept? Well, the concept is all about the fact of, on the one side, you've got the disciples, who they are, what they are, um, their training, their upbringing, their culture, um, what they've learned down at the synagogue, what the rabbi has taught them. Uh, here's their traditions, here's their personalities, here's their talent. Here's all that they are within themselves, sourced by themselves. Now, over on this side, Whoa, something has changed. Over here, you've not get, j just got the disciples and their talent and their ability. Now you've got the sourcing, the empowering of the Holy Spirit himself. See, over here, you've got all that they can do. Over here, you've got all that he wants to do through them. See, over here, you've got all of their talent displayed. Hey, yeah, you know, their abilities. Over here, you've got, whoa, the divine activities of God and His ability and what He is bringing on. See, over here, you've got their educational level. You've got their stupidity. You've got what they can think up. Over here, you've got, wow, the divine wisdom of God literally being share, shared with a whole group of men and dwelt within them, giving them the mind of Christ Himself. See, over here, you've got, oh, what they can pull off, how they can operate, uh, who they can persuade. Over here, you've got the winter workings of the Holy Spirit, sourcing them and moving them and literally penetrating the lives of people with the power of the message of the gospel of Christ. 
See, you've got over here, you've got trying, striving, doing, uh, attempting, straining. Over here, you've got relaxing, leaning, depending, yielding, allowing the flow of the life of God. See, you've got over here pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Over here, you've got the dynamic of God literally empowering you, lifting you, moving you, energizing you, aliving you, quickening you, regenerating you, rejuvenating you. All of that's going on over here. You, you see, over here on this side, you, you've got the disciples, you've got them attempting, you've got their arguments, you've got, they are living, producing themselves. Over here, you've got, oh, they are being produced by the Spirit of God, and His nature is flowing through them, and His life is permeating out of them, and they are literally moving their world with the aliveness of God. Here's the disciples, here's the wonder of the Holy Spirit. See, the emphasis has shifted. This is Old Testament. Testament. This is duty. This is doing. This is obligation. This is the best we can pull off. This is New Testament. This is New Covenant. This is the aliveness of God. The best He can do. All that He wants to do on my, in my life. Dancing upon the stage of my being. Demonstrating the aliveness of Himself. It's what Jesus was all about. That's what this whole thing is, is, is all about. It, it's verse 8, man. It's the concept. Did, did you know in this book, yeah, in this book, the disciples are not told to go. No, they're not told to go. Hey, uh, crank it up, set a schedule. Hey, uh, uh, get up at a certain time, operate, make so many calls a day. Come on, get, get, your, get your operation, get organized. Hey, get it laid down. Hey, discipline yourself, set, set your timer. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Hey, move it, move it, move it. See, they're not told to do that over here. <laughs> you know what they're told to do that in this book? They're told to wait, wait. Don't, don't wait, don't go, wait, wait. Well, didn't they go? Oh, man, did they go. They went everywhere. They literally went everywhere and won their whole world in 70 years. Hey, but they weren't told to go. They were told to wait. But in waiting, they went. Because waiting somehow brings about going. Only you're not going in yourself. They were to wait and then the dynamic of the power of the Spirit just literally moved them. And God began to orchestrate the circumstances and the situations. And they began to spill into their world and made an impact. And, and it wasn't that they were told to go and they strategized how they were go, got the demographics of the towns. Hey, who are we dealing with? What's the cultural environment? Blah, 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 blah. No, man, they just, whoa, God just moved and dynamically won their world. Praise the Lord. How did it happen? It's the divine activity of God moving. It's the theme of the whole book. And verse 8 is the concentrated form of that theme. Over here on this side, did you realize that the disciples in this book are not told to speak? Now, here's what we want you to do. We want you to develop your communication skills so you'll be able to, you know, impact the crowds and, and tell the right jokes. And, and, and you need to start with kind of a, kind of a, 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 a update, something that the crowd would be in. Oh, okay, take the morning newspaper, play off of that. Yeah, get that. Hey, see, they weren't told to do that. They weren't told to go Saturday seminars, learn how to speak. Hey, take some speech classes. Hey, uh, develop some good illustrations. That's it. Personal illustrations. Hey, yeah, brag on yourself while you're doing it. Hey, uh, really get... They, see, they weren't told to do that. They weren't told to do that. They weren't told to speak. Well, didn't they speak? Whoa! Did they speak, brother? They spoke in languages they did not even know. Wow. How do you explain that? It's a divine God thing, man. God is taking over. God is acting. They, have, they are responding to the divine action of God himself. They are moving under the power of the, of, the, of the dynamic of God himself. They're not producing this. This isn't their strategy. This isn't their production. This isn't what they're doing. This is the divine action of God. See, they, the, they, they weren't told in this book. They, they weren't told, now, organize. Yeah, organize and uh, get a flow chart so everybody, and job description, so everybody knows it'll cut down a lot of arguments in the movement. Hey, and they'll, everybody will know what their responsibilities are. And, oh, get a 501c3, yeah, nonprofit organization, register with the government of Rome so you can get a tax break. Yeah, that'll really help. And, hey, uh, hey uh, uh, plot out what you're, see, they weren't told to do that. 
Well, didn't they do that? Well, yeah, I mean, they eventually organized and had church buildings, and yeah, they, uh, but they didn't, they, they weren't told to do that. I mean, they just kind of did that. That was just, that didn't matter. That was no big deal. That was no, whoa, we gotta, no, you don't gotta. Hey, what you have to do, man, is the movement of the Holy Spirit. Hey, out of that, there spills this. Everything was generated out of that. Do you see that? See, it's, it's not against, we're not against anything. Hey, we're not against the development of leadership. Well, sure, we need leaders. Everybody knows that. We're not, a, we're not against buildings. Well, sure, you've got to have a place to meet. We understand, we, we're not against parking lots, location. Hey, we're not, we're not against any of that. We're not against staff and, hey, handling it right. And, and, and we're, not, we're not against proper accounting. We're, come on. We're not against any of that. That's all fine and good, but we all know that's not what this is really all about. That you can have all of that and get no place, man. That you can have all that kind of thing and never win anybody to Jesus. That, that, that evangelism doesn't take place because you have a good accounting. Evangelism doesn't take place because, well, you're well organized. Evangelism doesn't take place, well, well, we got a new building. I don't know why they don't come. See, that's not the key to evangelism. Hey, he says, hey, the whole heart and soul of this thing is the moving aliveness of God within man. So a shift is taking place from what they can do, who they are, their talent, their ability, into God is acting, God is moving, hey, God is pulling off a big deal. This is a tremendous, overwhelming thrust of the divine God in the world. And a whole, that's the concept of verse 8. Oh, did you get the words? Get them, man. Hey, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, that's the concept. Now, what we want to do uh, in this class period for our focus for the rest of our time is, well, if you've got that concept, we want to go and analyze the words themselves in this passage and see how these words help us strengthen and, and bring stability to that concept because that's what these words are all about. Now, as you look at the verse, it becomes, you, you can begin to see an automatic breakdown uh, in the verse. You'll note that the verse starts out with, you shall receive power. And then there's a parallel statement. It's too obvious to miss. I'm sure you picked up on it. You shall receive power. And then a parallel statement that says, you shall be witnesses. So, you have this this, this parallel, these two parallel statements. You shall receive power, you shall be witnesses. There it is. And that becomes the structure of the entirety of the verse itself. Now, note this as you look at the verse. You shall receive power, you shall be witnesses, and sandwiched in between that statement is this idea when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So these two statements revolve around, circle, literally sandwich this whole idea of when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So the heart of the whole thing, you shall receive power, you shall be witnesses. The heart of the whole thing is when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That's the whole heart and soul of all that's going on in the verse. Everything revolves around that. It is phenomenal. Now, we want to begin to analyze these statements. Let's start with this opening statement of the, of the verse. You shall receive power. You shall receive power. Phenomenal. Uh, you know that uh, you shall receive is one single Greek word. I'm sure you got this in your saturation. It's one single Greek word. You shall receive. And when you look at this word, you will discover it's in the future indicative. Wow, I know that excites you, doesn't it? It's in the future indicative. Now, what does the future indicative have to say to us? Well, what you discover is the future indicative tells us, well, drop the future because that's the idea it'll happen. Uh, it's going to happen. It's not happening now, but it will happen. And, of course, this is in the future. Jesus is telling them about Pentecost and what's going to take place just a few days down the road. So it's in the future. But the indicative, focus on the indicative. Now, the idea of the indicative is, the indicative means it's a simple 
statement of fact. In other words, hey, you can go to the bank on this. I mean, this is just the way it is. Hey, I'm just laying it out for you. Hey, I'm not arguing with you. Hey, I'm not trying to prove anything. I'm just telling you, hey, you shall receive indicative, simple statement of fact. It's the way it is. You can go to the bank on this. You can be assured of this. We're not going to argue about this. Hey, we're not going to vote on this. Put your hand down. We're not going to bring this to any church board. We're not going to bring this to any committee. Hey, we're not going to discuss this in the general church movement. Hey, this will not be debated. Hey, this is not up for questions. We're not going to have questions and answer. And how can this be? In a, no, we're not. Hey, I'm, I'm laying it out for you. A simple, basic, this is the way it is. You shall receive. Wow. But, you see, we should have already known that. And the reason we should have already known that is because he started this whole progression, this whole discussion, this whole conversation with verse 4. Go back to verse 4 and look at it. Chapter 1. Verse 4 of Acts. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now you realize the context of all of this is the promise of the Father. He said, I'm telling you about the promise of the Father. It's not new to you. I've discussed with the, this with you lots of times. Then he moves into John the Baptist, his baptism, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the old, the new, uh, hey, the outside, the inside, and he begins to parallel, contrast those two. Then he moves into this discussion about source by God. You shall receive. So all of this is in the context of promise of the Father. Wow. Promise of the Father. Now, it's really significant that when you look at the uh, Greek word for promise, you'll discover there's actually two different Greek words that can be translated promise. And the reason there's two different Greek words, of course, when we come to our English, we just translate it promise, and we can't tell the difference between the two. But in the original language of the Bible, there's two different words which we translate into our English word promise. And they paint slightly different pictures. All they have some of the same meaning. Basics maybe are the same. But they're, they, they paint slightly, have slightly a different emphasis. There's slightly a different picture being painted by these two words. Now when he talks here in verse 4, and the verse we're dealing with in verse 8 about the promise of the Father. Promise, hey, that, that, that is a significant picture. But in order to get that picture, I want to give you the picture of this other Greek word. Not the one that's in verse 4, but an other, another Greek word that we translate promise. Uh, to get the picture, I need to take you back to a scene uh, in the New Testament. It's Herod Antipas. You know, Herod Antipas is throwing a big party. All the dignitaries are there. Yeah, they're lounging while they ate, which I think is really a neat idea. So they're lounging while they ate. And as they're lounging, uh, they're about half drunk, to tell you the truth. And Herod Antipas, he's not really got himself under control. He raises up and calls for his wife, of course. His wife wasn't his wife. You know the story. It was his mistress. Yeah. And really, it was, uh, uh, she was uh, his brother's wife, Philip. Uh, yeah. And he had gone and had a visit with Philip and seduced Philip's wife to come and live with him. So now, they're not married, but it's his brother's wife. And really, it's his mistress, but he calls for his wife. And you understand, that's how John the Baptist got into trouble with Herod Antipas. Uh, was all over this. Uh, he'd been accusing of the, him of this and telling him of his sin and telling him to get right and send that woman back. So that had been some of the conflict. So they're having this big party. Herod Antipas is about half drunk, calls for his wife, who really isn't his wife, but is his mistress, come out, hey, and, and, and says to her, hey, you got a teenage daughter. Sure, and she did. You have a teenage daughter. Send your teenage daughter out here and let her dance for us. And if she pleases us, hey, I will grant to her up to half of my kingdom. I promise up to half of my kingdom. Hey, deal was made. Daughter was sent out. She danced for them and she did please them. And uh, now it came time for the fulfillment of her request. What is your request? I promised you and I will, I will keep my promise. What is your request? Oh, she simply said, want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. 
Wow. Now, her mother had put her up to that. You know that. And uh, Herod Antipas began to squirm in his lounge couch, man. Oh, man. That guy, many people say he's a prophet of God. I, I don't want to mess with him. Who knows what's going to happen if I, oh, man, what am I going to, well, well, I promise, well, and everybody's looking at me, wondering what I'm going to do, and oh, well, I, man, I'm obligated. I'm well, she's got me over a barrel. Oh, me and my big mouth. Why did I, oh, I'm against the wall. Well, 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 oh, okay, okay, hey, you can have the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So he kept his promise. Now, that's one word. It's the idea of reluctance. It's the idea of forced. It's the idea of have to. It's the idea of, well, I'd really prefer not to, but, well, I promise. It's that kind of idea. Now, let me take you to what we're dealing with here. Ha! Promise of the Father. Oh, promise of the Father. It literally has the idea and paints the picture of an open heart. Oh, you got to get this. It's, it's the Father sitting on the edge of his throne, anxious, oh, anxious, desiring with his whole being, longing, longing, longing to fulfill that which he has promised. He's not holding out on us. He's not withdrawn. It's not an obligation. He's not under duty. We haven't got him over a barrel. We're not going to have to take him to court and force him to this. He's sitting on the edge of his seat. His heart is wide open. He longs. He's looking for the slightest availability. He's looking for the slightest possibility that he might literally pour out and grant this promise. He longs to do it. Oh, Praise the Lord. Isn't that good news? See, he's not playing hide-seek with us. He's not tantalizing us. He's not teasing us. See, nothing like that is going on here. This is the promise of the Father, the open heart, how he longs. Hey, he longs to give you victory. He longs for you to be what you ought to be. He aches inside. He longs. He's anxious for you to walk as you should. He wants to give you holiness. He wants to give you power over sin. He wants to use your life. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to have peace. He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants you to have joy. He longs for you to have wisdom. He longs for you to be the kind of parent you ought to be. He longs for your ministry. He longs, oh, he desires. Hey, he's not holding out. He's not reserved. He's not, hey, you don't have to beg him. He's, he's anxious. He wants this more than you want it. That's what's going on here. You shall receive. I'm telling you, it's indicative. It's a promise, man. It is a promise. You can go to the bank on this. It's the way it is, man. It's just, hey, it, it, it's, it's done, brother. It's done. Hey, receive. Open up, man. Hey, see, I'm convinced that people don't get saved at an altar of prayer. Oh, I know. They're sitting back there in their seat. The message is preached. Altar call is given. And there's this overwhelming sense and desire. Uh, there's this overwhelming sense and desire to, uh, to, uh, of God to save them and they have a desire to be saved so they get out of their seat and they make their way they make their way to an altar of prayer but hey I'm convinced that they don't get saved in an altar of prayer see I'm convinced that the minute they are in their seat God is dealing with them and the minute they begin to respond the minute they begin to respond the minute you get out of your seat man the minute you head down the aisle God can't wait till you get to the altar to save you God, God can't wait he's he just so anxious so he does it back there he just, he just, oh, he wants to do this. He aches to do this. He longs to do this. This is the beating of his heart. This is a promise you shall receive. <laughs> you can count on it, man. You can go to the bank on this. Now, what is it we're going to receive? Well, of course, that's given to us in the rest of this phrase as the verse is opened up to it. You shall receive power. Now, of course, if you're going to understand what he's dealing with, you're going to have to get clear out of your mental pictures of power as you have experienced in this world. In other words, it doesn't have anything to do with that. But you see, in our world, we think in terms of, oh, he's got power, meaning what? Well, he knows so-and-so, who knows so-and-so, and man, he's well-connected, hey, and, and all he has to do is get on the phone, and whoa, he knows who to call, and things begin to happen. He's got power, brother. Woo! Man, he can get, hey, he's a shaker and a mover. We're not dealing with that. That's not what he's talking about. 
Uh, power. Oh, well, hey, hey. Woo, he's loaded, brother. I'm talking, whoa, man. Hey, he is loaded. And he can, he can, hey, hey, people pay attention to him, brother. Hey, everybody wants a, wants a hunk of him, man. Yeah, oh, he's got, hey. see, power. That's not what he's dealing with. That's not what they're talking about in verse 8. So you got to get that power of, of name dropping and, and, and personal position and, and money and, and ability and that kind of stuff. Hey, power in terms of, hey, don't mess with him. Hey, he'll bang you, man. He'll knock you down, brother. He'll, he'll pop your nose, son. I mean, hey, you won't, hey, he's, and he can do it. He stole, he, he, hey, he knows. See, no, don't, the power. He studied under Chuck Norris. Power, man, power. See, that, that's not what we're dealing with here. Verse 8 is altogether different. So what you need to do is come to the biblical perception of what he's talking about in terms of power. You shall receive power. Now it's really intriguing to me that as you get into the idea of the book of Acts, of what this power is, there is that there is an equating in the book. There is an equating of the person of Jesus Christ and power. That is, the Spirit of Jesus Christ and power become equivalent terms. In fact, I challenge you to go through the book of Acts. Every place you see the word power, strike it out and put Holy Spirit or Spirit of Jesus there. Hey, every time you see Holy Spirit or Spirit of Jesus, strike it out and put power. It works, man. It works because you see what he's really talking about, what we're really dealing with when we're talking about power is we're talking about the Spirit of Jesus. Power is not some entity or some, some, some substance that he carries around in his hip pocket and gives to you. It's not something he divvies out. It's what he is within himself. Jesus is the power. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus is the power. He doesn't give you power. He is power. What you need is not power. What you need is him. Hey, and, and we've gone over this before because this is so important, man. You've you got to get this locked into your thought process until you think in these, ter in these terms. Because this is the biblical approach to everything. And if, if you don't think in these terms, then, then you have a wrong approach to everything the Scripture is saying to us. See, Jesus, everything is contained within the person of Jesus. That Jesus doesn't have anything to give to you. He is everything. That he hasn't come along and, and, and made a batch of stuff. He didn't come along and, and he's the inventor of something and, and made a whole lot of them. He didn't come along and, and have his laboratory and, and boil some things out and mix some things up and, and yeah, left it for us. So now we can come to the church and get this stuff and Jesus is pleased when we use what he made. It's not that at all. Jesus himself is what is going on. See, he didn't have a formula. Well, if he had a formula, he himself is the formula. Well, he had a plan. Well, yeah, but he himself is the plan. Well, he had a resource. I know, but he himself is the resource. You understand, we deal with this all the time in the scriptures. Well, well, Jesus is the high priest. I know. He's offering the sacrifice for our sins. That's right. Well, what's he offering himself? Because he's the whole deal. He's the whole ball of wax, man. He, he, he's the high priest and he is the sacrifice that the high priest is offering. See, there isn't anything outside of him. He is everything. He is total, absolute salvation. Outside of the person of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. You do not get saved by an experience. You get saved by Jesus because he comes to be within you. And when he gives you himself, you have salvation because he is salvation. See, he never gives you anything that you take and use apart from him. Like he's over there, I'm over here, I have it, thank you Jesus, appreciate it, and you use it. No, everything is connected with him. Everything is ingrained in him. He is everything. So what we're dealing with, man, is Jesus is the power. And that's equated in the book of Acts. Everywhere you turn in the book of Acts, Jesus is the power. Now, you know the word power here is really the word for dynamite. And you've heard that before. And uh, as you look at it, 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 it's explosive, in other words, in nature. 
that the power and presence and person of Jesus is explosive in its very nature. That when he comes, upset takes place. When he comes, disturbance. When he comes, things can't be like they've been, man. He explodes things. This word in the New Testament, that is in the Gospel accounts, is, is most often translated mighty deeds. I love that. Jesus marches into town and did mighty deeds. And what's these mighty deeds all about? Whoa, he's exploding his world brother. He's literally moving. It's measurable. Miracle there. Hey, upset there. T temple turned upside down there. Man, he's moving on it. Why? It's the power, the explosive nature of Christ. Hey, if he comes to your life, what do you think he's going to do? Explode, man. He's going to explode your, your commonplace. He's going to explode your traditions. Explode your lukewarmness. Hey, you can't be the same. Hey, and you've been asking him to come, man. He's going to disrupt your world, shake your finances, bother your plans, upset your career, move your whole life, brother. Why? Well, he's explosive in his very nature. So when the power, which is the person of Jesus, comes, it's, it, it, it alters, it, it changes. Get ready for the blows, man. Hey, it's just the very nature of who he is. Now, any commentary that you, or that is any Greek dictionary, lexicon, that you want to go to and look up this word power, they'll all tell you the same identical thing. They'll all tell you that what he's dealing with, that what this word has to do with is an innate power. An innate power that resides within a thing by virtue of its nature. Now you've got to understand that. It's an innate power that resides within a thing by virtue of its nature. Now, what does that mean? It means that the power is not an instrument he gives to you. It's not something he places in your hand. It's not that kind of deal at all. See, it's not something you can use. It's not a tool to fix things. Oh, listen, I got this terrible trial going on. I got this terrible temptation. Man, I really need help. Jesus, give me some power. He hands some to you. Thank you, Jesus. I really need that for this particular time. So you use that power to have victory over this temptation. Wow, now that's done. Hey, now I'm okay. I can operate on my own. See, it's not that at all. It's not something he gives to you. An example of that would be a gun. Hey, I have an instrument called a gun. I have it in my hand. Hey, I got the power, brother. Whew, I got the power. I can make you do anything I want you to do. Hey, I, 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 can, I, hey, I, I can put you on your face, man. I can, I can take your money, son. I can make you say what I want you to say, boy. Hey, I, why? I got the power, buddy. I got the power, man. And when you got the power, it's an instrument, a gun I have in my hand. Oh, no. Somebody took away my power. Somebody had a bigger gun than I did. So all of a sudden, I'm stripped of my power. See, that's not what he's dealing with. Not in this verse. See, this is not an instrument. This is not an external. This is not something. See, this is an, an, an innate power that resides within a thing by virtue of its nature. So this is not a, a gun in the hand that you can use. Hey, I've got the power. I can heal who I want to. Hey, I can... Hey, you're down. Hey, I can, I can do what I want to do, see? Hey, I, I've got the power. But see, that's not what this is all about. This is not you using the power. This is about him coming to be within you and he begins to use you. See, this is a total shift in thought process. See, you don't use the power. The power uses you. You don't control the power. The power controls you. See, you don't dominate the power. The power dominates you. You don't manipulate the power. The power manipulates you. Do you understand it? See, this is an innate power that goes to the very depth of your nature and intertwines itself within the very nature of your being and produces a whole new thing in and through you until you are possessed and mastered by the power itself. Very, very significant. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I, have a, uh, I have a bowl here. I have a bowl, and in this bowl there is blue dye. Blue is my favorite color. There is blue dye in this bowl. And hey, I got this colorless, war I got this colorless cloth. Yeah, colorless cloth. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this colorless cloth and I'm going to submerge it into the blue dye. 
And as I put it into the blue dye, I poke it down in, it, 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 it goes under, it begins to absorb the blue dye into its fiber. I, I leave it there for quite some time, come back, grab a hold of the corners of this colorless cloth, pull this colorless cloth up and say, whoa, you turn to me and say, hey, this cloth is blue. In fact, I flip it a little and you get a little, sorry for the blue dye. Hey, it's dripping with blue. It's blue all over. It's blue inside, it's blue outside. This cloth is blue. I immediately correct you, of course, and say, no, no. The cloth is not blue. The cloth is colorless. Remember, it was a colorless cloth. It's the dye that's blue. You say, no, this cloth is blue. I say, no, no, you're not getting this. This is a colorless cloth. It's the dye that's blue. Well, you turn to me and say, hey, you may want to say that, but you just try to take the blue out of that. You just try to take the blue out of that, oh, out of that cloth. Hey, you can't get the blue out. Hey, you can dry it, you can wash it, you can beat it, you can do anything you want to do, but that cloth is blue. Well, it's not blue, it's, it's, the, it, it's the dye that's blue, but you see the dye has gone to the depth of the fiber of the cloth. The dye has gone to the internal makeup of that cloth. The dye has gone to the very heart of all that the cloth is about. See, the dye has literally infiltrated until that cloth, man, it is so dominated and so controlled and so infiltrated with with blue, woo, you can't get the blue. I mean, the blue is in charge. That cloth is blue, whether it wants to be or not. And everywhere the cloth goes, it doesn't try to be blue. It is blue. It doesn't strain to be blue. It doesn't guard itself so it can be blue. It just is blue. It isn't blue because it wants to be. It's just plain flat blue. It can't help itself. It's dominated, controlled, mastered by blue. That's phenomenal, man. See, can you imagine Jesus picking you up, submerging you into his blue dye, <laughs> the presence of himself? He just, hey, get down there, boy. Hey, breathe it in, breathe it out. You absorb it in the pores of your flesh. It begins to go all over. It's in your eyeballs, man, up your nostrils. It's in your mouth, man. It's in your tongue. It's in your attitude. It's in your emotions and in your nerves. It's in the way you feel. Your whole being is literally being absorbed into the blue dye of the presence of God. And you're breathing him in and breathing him out. One day God comes down, picks me up by my ears, man, hey, and announces to the world, this boy is blue. <laughs> hey, he's blue all over. And everybody said, nah, he's not blue. Well, well, hey, it's the blue dye, man. It's the fullness of God that's come to live within him. And he's just absorbed. He's controlled. He's mastered. You can't take it out of him. It's gone to his very nature. It's infiltrated his very mind. It's in control of him. He's yielded. He's responding. He's allowing. He's moving. He's under the auspices of, dominated by control. The boy is blue all over. He doesn't try to be blue. He doesn't struggle to be blue. Well, it's not his duty. No, he's just plain flat blue. He can't help himself. He, he, he snores blue at night. He gets up blue in the morning. He goes to bed blue at night. He eats blue. Hey, shake his hand. Sorry for the blue. Hey, blue is ever... When he walks down the hallway, he drips blue in the hallway, man. When he touches the wall, oh, sorry for the blue. Everywhere he goes, he paints everything blue. Hey, every time I look at him, I see blue, blue, blue. The guy is just plain flat blue. He can't help himself. He's blue all over. He drips blue. He thinks blue. He is blue. Oh, that's what he's talking about in verse 8. That you can enter into an experience. You shall receive power. Not an instrument in your hand that you can use. Oh, that God is literally going to infiltrate the depth of your nature. He's literally going to take his nature and he's going to go so deep within you and intertwine himself with your being that you and God are going to be so tight that you and the Christ are going to be so one that all that he is, his resource, his power, his being is literally going to flow in and out of you and you're going to know the dynamic display of all that God is, man. All all that God is. Hey, it's going to be the hand in the glove, son. Hey, you're going to know the power of the person of Jesus literally moving through you. He's going to put you on like a suit and your muscles are going to bulge. Hey, not because you're, mu hey, his muscles, man. And you're going to take shape and form and march downtown and damn it, and you're going to be right in the middle of it. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you're not lazy. God is acting. God is moving. Hey, you're going to become his skin. You're going to be the skin of God. And God is going to wear you and you're going to 
be his body and you're literally going to demonstrate the essence of who he is all over the place. What a wonder because it's the divine activity of God. You shall receive power. Not an instrument in your hand. Not something you can use. Not something you can use for, well, Sunday morning when I get up. I really need that. Hey, pick it up. Hey, psh, hey. No, man. This is who you are. Everywhere. All the time. Living. Until out of you there begins to flow this dynamic essence of blue, brother. And your world. They can't help but see blue. You talk blue. You think blue. You are blue. You don't mention blue, but man, they see blue. They can't help themselves. They are pressured by the blue that spills in and out of your life. Your office is filled with blue. Your home is filled with blue. Hey, your church is just, woo, come and sit in the blue, man. Whoa, it's the essence of the presence of a divine God who's literally mastered my life, infiltrated my nature, gone to the depth of my being. Hey, man, I got to have that. I got to have that. Hey, I want verse 8 in my life. I don't want to preach verse 8. I don't want to talk about verse 8. I want to experience verse 8. I want to be blue all over. Not because I try. Not because I've disciplined myself. Not because I've, I've thought, it, thought it through and learned the doctrine. Not be, oh man, I want the essence of God's presence. Blue, man, blue. Jesus, please make me blue.